Here is the Prime Minister of Australia. As long as they don't touch mad as hell, I'm happy. Thank you very much, thank you. Now, I, uh, I don't know about you folks, but I am greatly relieved this week. Victorian Labor Premier Daniel Andrews has come in for a lot of stick from the Federal Government over the past few months for his autocratic handling of his state's health crisis. So it's been refreshing to see the Federal Government laying into Anastasia Palaszczuk instead. It's also great to see that it's not just uh, state Labor governments under pressure, with uh, Gladys Berejiklian's coalition government in New South Wales also the subject of a political pylon. Though not from the Federal Government so much as from itself. Or at least that bit of it run by the Deputy Premier and Nationals leader John Barillaro. Now, normally, Gladys and John get on very well. John usually confines his destabilising to the Federal Government. The State Coalition Cabinet, though, is united and strong, particularly when they're dealing with uh, big issues like being blamed for the Ruby Princess debacle by the ABF. But sometimes something comes along that's bigger than a global pandemic. Something like koalas. In fact, in this instance, actually koalas. Koalas! Now, as the history books show, John Barillaro took a principled stand against his own government's koala protection policy, a move, I think, made even nobler by the fact that he himself had signed off on the policy. Now, that takes guts. He insisted that if the koala policy wasn't changed, he and his Nationals colleagues would leave the coalition and, presumably after donning PPE gear, move to the crossbench or while somehow retaining their ministerial portfolios. Now, when it was pointed out to him by Premier Berejiklian that that wasn't possible and that he and his fellow national ministers would have to resign their ministries, in the spirit of compromise, John Barillaro said, oh, don't worry about it then. I'm paraphrasing. Obviously, the word fuck would have been in there and probably arse. And I'm guessing uh, up, stick, yours and it. Anyway, it's all over now, of course, uh, as is John's career, but essentially the main point of difference was that the Libs want to make sure that the koalas didn't become extinct, whereas the Nats wanted them all dead. Is that a fair summation political naturalist I'll be talking to later, Lindy B. Ankle? The political environment is a complicated ecosystem, Sean, isn't it, buddy? Hey, off you go. See, without the farmers, the nationals will become extinct. Mm -hmm. The farmers need to be able to clear land and that affects the trees. And that affects the koalas in the trees, which affects tourism, which need the koalas to be alive because otherwise Australia's national image is too dependent on other animals that are less cuddly. Like this little fella. <sighs> so, the koala, it's got to be. And that's despite, or perhaps because of, their chlamydia, and incontinence. Mm. You didn't bring along a koala with you tonight? Very hard to find these days, Sean, as are lots of native fauna. Mm. The Nationals proposed sitting on the crossbench despite keeping their ministries. Normally, crossbenchers wouldn't be allowed into Cabinet meetings, so how is that ever going to work? Oh, it would have made things a lot easier, Sean. The Nationals go to the Cabinet meetings, yeah. hear about what the Liberals had in mind, and then go back onto the floor and vote against it. Essentially, legislation can be killed off without having to go through a lot of unnecessary due process, just like what they wanted to do with the koalas. Right. Well, all that's coming up a bit later on. Not now. Also ahead is Health Minister Greg Hunt hatching a new mental health plan. If so, it explains why he's been sitting on the Productivity Commission's report for ten weeks. And in international news, Donald Trump has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his role in brokering the Israel-UAE peace accord. Actually, that doesn't surprise me. He made his fortune in real estate development and certainly knows a thing or two about how to get a subdivision approved. Plus, a very special pair of gold-plated glasses worn by Indian independence leader Mahatma Gandhi have sold at a British auction house for over 475,000 Australian dollars. 475,000 Australian dollars? <laughs> Should have gone to Specsavers. Speaking of international news coming up, uh, there won't be any about China, at least not from any Australian journalists. China's latest beef, which ideally would be Australian, concerns Australian news presenter Chung Lei, who works for the state-owned China Global Television Network, being charged with endangering China's security, which uh, would be the equivalent here of our government arresting and detaining Andrew Proben. So you can imagine how jealous the Australian government is of China's powers. 
The concern is that uh, this is the latest in a tit-for-tat exchange between the two countries. The tit being Scott Morrison, who requested an inquiry into the source of the coronavirus outbreak, and the tat being what China has done with our beef, barley and wine. That is, made a kind of punitive trade casserole. And, of course, the uh, latest escalation is the ABC having to pull correspondent Bill Bertels out of China, which I assume is because China found his typical ABC views too left-wing. And now Australian companies doing business in China are starting to wonder whether hitching their wagon to an oppressive communist regime was such a good idea. The chief executive of Elders says that treatment of Australian journalists like Bertels was designed to send a message to Australia that Beijing was killing the chicken to scare the monkey. Obviously something that goes on a lot in their wet markets. Foreign Minister Maurice Payne is also worried, warning Australians were at risk of arbitrary detention, which at least sounds a bit more targeted than the statewide detention going on in Victoria at the moment. But right now, with his take on the crisis, here's Tosh Greenslade in a wig and glasses. That's exactly right, Sean. The love affair between China and Australia, which began with such promise in the 1850s, with the Chinese coming over here and digging up our gold and us taxing them more extortionately than everyone else pursuant to our white Australia policy, has ended in tears, with us price gouging our iron ore to them, them sending back our barley because it's got weeds in it, us accusing them of not washing their pangolins and bats properly, them arriving here unannounced that time on aircraft carriers to buy bulk buy all our baby formula, us not letting them install 5G in our country, them proving they don't need to by hacking our personal data anyway, ASIO investigating their spies, them complaining about our wine dumping, our foreign investment review board not letting them buy our dairy industry, and now this. Dozens of lizards hidden in rice cookers have been discovered by Australia Post, destined for China's black market. The final straw in any escalation of trade tension, taking a country's lizards. It goes to the very heart of who we are as a nation, why we even have a frill-necked one on our two-cent piece. Australia is a proud, multicultural, tolerant, unxenophobic country and can put up with almost anything a foreigner does, providing he or she speaks English and doesn't dress too funny. But when they start smuggling lizards out of the country in rice cookers, then it's time to stop pretending we're not racist. Unless, of course, the lizards were a decoy and they were actually smuggling rice cookers, but I can't imagine there would have been a shortage of those over there. Sean. Mm. Thank you, Tosh. Tosh Greenslade there in a wig and glasses. Tosh, incidentally, has a book out in November, but sadly I can't mention the title or even show it to you on camera because of the ABC's strict no advertising policy. I'll mention it. It's called... We beeped him. And as if the news for our export industries wasn't bad enough, now our struggling tax avoidance sector is being dealt a body blow, with the government threatening to bring forward tax cuts to high-income earners. The logic being that our economy is in a state of deep freeze at the moment and needs to be thawed out as soon as possible. But will the global warming of tax relief be enough to melt the glacier that is our economy? Spokesicle for the Finance Minister, Darius Horsham. We've got to do something to stimulate this cold turd of an economy, Sean. And if it means cosying up to the already well off and so be it. Yeah, but aren't, aren't high-income earners more likely to save or pay off debt with that money rather than spend it to achieve that stimulus? Large safes, electrified compound fencing, crocodile-infested moats, all purchases made more likely by further enriching the wealthy and all pumping money back into the economy. You've heard of trickle-down economics. Sure. Well, people are willing to spend a lot of money to stop that trickle. And frankly, as long as Genghis Kendrews keeps Victoria in lockdown and Anastasia Palaszczuk keeps the borders closed in Queensland, we don't have a lot of Options. An antifreeze. Sorry, hang on. Can, sorry, can I stop you there? Genghis Candrews? Anastasia Palashame? Daniel Cantrews? Stay away, Palaché. I've got a list here. Doesn't somewhere. matter, doesn't matter. But, but uh, let me ask you this. Are the tax cuts the right approach with huge debt and the pandemic exposing the fragile state of our health and welfare systems? Don't we need more government revenue? Sean, you are being an economic dinosaur. And you know what killed the dinosaur? They own farts! But I... Hello, Economics 101, McFly. You can't raise taxes without disincentivizing activity. What about a death tax? That doesn't discourage people from dying. Mm. Mind you, if it did, it'd really get us out of a hole with the aged care debacle. But for everyone else, being left a million dollars if you can spend a night in an eccentric great-uncle's haunted mansion might just be one of the few remaining paths into the housing market. Well, thank you, Darius. Fantastic. A feel-good story now, because I think we all deserve one in these difficult times. Pauline Hanson's One Nation's Pauline Hanson is in the news again. And no, 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 it's not because she said something dreadful or unintelligible. It was because she tried to do something nice. 
After calling residents of Victoria's lockdown tower blocks alcoholics and drug addicts from non-English speaking backgrounds back in July and being fired by the Today Show as a result, Pauline tried to make amends by sending each of those residents a One Nation stubby holder normally valued at $7 with a note that said, no hard feelings. A beautiful gesture, cruelly thwarted by the City of Melbourne, who intercepted the Australia Post delivery because of the lockdown, thus causing even more of a delay than would have been the case had Australia Post been allowed to do its job in its usual slipshod fashion. Now, there were people out there who thought Pauline's gift of this stubby holder was distasteful, given that she'd referred to some of the residents as alcoholics. But may I remind you that the stubby holders could also be used as a container for the heroin needles and spoons, or as a caddy for the chopsticks or other weird cutlery they use to eat their greasy cooking, thus covering the drug addicts and foreigners as well. Visit Pauline's online shop for other great gift ideas, whether it be One Nation pens, which you'll notice have no point to them, and One Nation t-shirts, also available in extra small. Incidentally, the reverse side of the stubby holder features this inspirational quote from Pauline, I've got the guts to say what you're thinking. Mantis Health's chief political reporter, Lois Price, is that true? Can Senator Hanson use her guts to say what we're all thinking? Well, Sean, from my position high in the sky, I'd say it's only true if the people in those towers were thinking, I'm a drug addict and an alcoholic and from a war-torn country and can't speak English. But if she's saying what I'm thinking, then I think I need a brain scan scrambled, muddled and illogical. And if she's saying what you're thinking, then why isn't she saying she's incoherent and ill-informed? Is your lounge suite looking old and tired? Fabric torn, covered in revolting human secretions? Why buy a new one or clean out when you can cover it with an old sheet for a fraction of the cost? Let the abrasive staff at Clive Bang old sheet supplies mask the disgusting squalor you live in today or sometime soon there's no urgency. Clive Bang hiding repulsive furniture since 2017. I'm Lois Price for Mad as Hell. Thanks very much, Lois. Well, after the break, Rio Tinto celebrates the appointment of its new executives in style and... <laughs> costumes on The Masked Singer getting very convincing. Sunday at 8.30, there are concerns among the sisters of Nanata's house for one of their own. Poor Sister Monica Jones' behaviour has been getting more erratic. Well, I don't think sitting close to the television set is helping. The electric picture box is more worthy of praise than God himself. I would not have discovered the wonders of rock and roll without it, which I find both mellifluous and uplifting. And if it is, as they say, the devil's work, then I love Satan! Anxieties too for those at the opposite end of the age spectrum. I don't think I'm ever going to pass my exams. I bet you a shilling you do. You seem very confident. I said a shilling, not half a crown. <laughs> You're such an annoying crone. Whoa. I'm going to go have some of Dad's oxycodone. And concerns Hello. become fears Hello. when passion becomes obsession. Sister Monica Joan, sit back from the TV set, really. I love television! Call the midwife, Sunday, 8.30. Round and round. Mm. Welcome back. Well, right now, as part of our continuing support of the arts industry in this country, Mad as Help presents the Tales of Stuart Robert, a nightmare ballet chronicling the various atrocities committed by one of the Prime Minister's closest friends and most incompetent boobs. Enjoy. Thanks, Sean. And our scene opens with the surprisingly undead in political terms, despite what he's done. Stuart Robert being haunted by his past indiscretions. Brian? That's right, Mags. Uh, the unlawful robo-debt scheme, that time he mistakenly charged taxpayers $38,000 for internet usage, a $40,000 Rolex watch he accepted from a Chinese businessman, the shares he held in a trust linked to the mining company of a generous Liberal Party donor, that time he created the impression he was in China in an official capacity for a signing ceremony between Chinese businesses and a mining company whose executive chairman was another generous Liberal Party donor, making his 80-year-old father a company director and naming his parents' home address as the company's principal place of business, which looked after tens of millions of dollars' worth of government contracts, that bullshit about the my.gov website crashing, and, of course, the two million taxpayer dollar waste of time, effort and bandwidth known as the COVID app. Yeah, he doesn't seem all that troubled by these things. Nor is anyone else in authority, Mags. Sean? Thank you very much, Maggie, and uh, thank you very much, big bad bastard Brian Plate. 
The unforgettable tales of Stuart Robert, no matter how much he'd like us to. Well, South Australia is my hometown, but I'm not going to let that stand in the way of calling it out when it's done something appalling and newsworthy, as they did recently by rolling out the red carpet for 300 students from Singapore while at the same time slamming the door on Victorian school students. Nate Spongely, who I went to school with, is from the South Australian Chamber of Death. Hi, Sean. Hi, Nate. Um, why? Well, Sean, it's just that higher education is one of our nation's biggest exports. One of those exports where you bring things into the country? Well, it brings foreign money into the country. So it's an import? No. Foreign students come here, we put university teachings inside of them, and then they take themselves back to their countries. Right, so it's a smuggling operation? Well, it's not the university sector's official position to see students as learning mules, but yes. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose the brain is the intestine into which the condoms of pure, uncut knowledge are secreted. Again, that's not the wording in our brochure, but sure. What, what are we talking about here? Why South Australia isn't allowing interstate students in. Yeah, yeah I know that, but why? Well, the same reason we won't allow Joe Blow in to visit his dad, but packets of spaghetti cross the border every day. Because international students aren't people, they're goods. Goods that need to stand in line for charity food to survive. Obviously, that's a tragedy. We'd much rather rich students who spend money on the local economy. But I guess beggars can't be choosers. Well, that's up to them. Thanks, Nate. That's all right. Well, coming up in sport, soccer team takes a waste strip, literally. But right now, sport. Well, as we know, this year's AFL Grand Final is to be played at the Gabba in Brisbane, a stadium with a capacity of 30,000. And to help you visualise that, that's not enough people to fill the MCG once over. But it's thrown up, as many of those fans will before Grand Final night's over, some issues around quarantine. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk says anyone entering Queensland from an area with significant community transmission has to quarantine for 14 days, including those involved in the grand final. Now, some whingers have suggested that there are double standards here, because while AFL employees can enjoy mango daiquiris in a swim-up bar, they haven't been allowed into Queensland for urgent medical appointments. Queensland health puppet are in breakfast. Why, why are people from the AFL given this sort of special treatment? Sean... These people are Australian Football League administrators and their families. That's right. They're not medical specialists. No, no, no. They're organising games of Australian rules football. That's right. Games of football. Games of football. Yes, I know. Games of football. Right. Games. That's right. They're administrators. Of football. That's right. I'm glad you understand, at least. <laughs> Thank you very much, RN. Now, uh, we talked a little earlier in the show about how tough it's been for some financially. Well... The good news is that the government's financial relief packages, along with early access to superannuation, have helped. The bad news is that it's helped those who prey on the vulnerable, with the ACCC saying $91 million had been lost to scams so far this year. Posey Scourge from the ACCC, you're announcing a compensation package for people who've been scammed of these funds. That's right, Sean. It's a 100% refund of all monies lost and all people have to do is send an email to the address on the screen now mm -hmm. attaching your Medicare card number, driver's licence number, bank account details and any associated passwords. And the amount you've lost. Yes, yes, yes. And how quickly can people expect to receive this compensation? Well, Sean, the sooner they email me the details, the sooner the money will start flowing. Thanks, Posey. But right now, looking ahead to tonight's weather, here's Concretia Doily. Thanks, Lefo. And a chilly one in the city today. Only reaching 12 degrees, but felt like 6. I turned 38 on Saturday, but on Sunday morning felt like 85. While the Ruby Princess fiasco occurred under the watch of Liberal governments, but felt like Labor. Sean? Thanks, Concretia. Posey, being at the ACCC, you'd know Terry Zabaglione, wouldn't you? Sean, <laughs> there is no Terry Zabaglione at the ACCC. OK. It... And to housing now, where the eviction ban is now ending for 8 million renters. This could mean some tough times ahead for renters like Wendell Vestibule. Oh, yes, it's been difficult, Sean. After I lost my job, I had to beg my landlord for a rent reduction. And how did your landlord respond? Oh, I really felt for her, Sean. Having her investment property underperform like that put a lot of strain on her financially. You came to an understanding? 
We talked through our mutually dire fiscal straits and both realised that having a roommate would help halve our costs of living. And so we moved in together. Well, that's, that's good then. Uh, unfortunately, because her income comes from my rent and she didn't have any income because I couldn't even pay the half I was supposed to, mm. she ended up falling short on her mortgage repayments by roughly 100%. Oh. Plus, because she was living in the house, she couldn't negatively gear the property anymore, so the interest due on the loan was no longer tax deductible, which only added to her monetary woes. And eventually, the bank seized the property and evicted us. Well, how terrible for both of you. Well, actually, I own an investment property freehold, so yeah. I'll be fine. Yeah. It's just Celeste I worry about. Celeste is your landlord? Was. Celeste was your landlord? No, Celeste is my pet cat. When I moved out, I accidentally left her at the rental property and I can't go around and pick her up because I don't have an intimate partner living there to visit so as to qualify for the Stage 4 lockdown travel exemption. <sighs> oh, well. well. You don't really like it, cat. Not enough to go around and root it. I'd be better off buying a new one. Mm. The, now, we were talking about the Australia-China tit-for-tat earlier in the show, and I think it's worth uh, pointing out that the uh, tits and the tats do not equal each other in this instance, and that Australia denies that its intervention with the Chinese journalists and academics is about silencing free speech. Australia is, of course, a strong supporter of media freedom, freedom of the press. Yeah, more so in China than here, obviously, but... I'm splitting hairs. Hairs that can now be found on the face of former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who described our relationship with China like this. Uh, the bottom line is the trajectory is all negative. In fact, on a graph, the trajectory would be the bottom line. China, though, has made a fairly unusual request. We demand that the Australian side immediately stop blatant, irrational acts. I mean, that would require us to scrap the Senate, but uh, I'm willing to if they are. But of all the recent headlines, I found this one the most disturbing of all. Wood borers detected in Bunnings bamboo screens imported from China. Bunnings team member Kebabs O'Lordy, tell us about it. If you've got an exposed area in your backyard or on your patio or deck, a bamboo privacy screen can be a simple, affordable solution. So these borers amount to yet another assault on our privacy by China. Spring is the perfect time to get done all those espionage jobs that you've put off, so you're ready to spy on all your trading partners over the Christmas break. Huawei bamboo privacy screens, $8.57 a metre. Bunnings Warehouse. Thanks a lot, Kebabs. Well, coming up, still one of the worst songs ever recorded by Paul McCartney. Plus, Francis Greenslade finds out exactly what went wrong with Oxford University's vaccine trial. That's coming up later. But right now, it's time for a bit of... Well, researchers from the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists say more than two trillion litres of water, enough to fill Sydney Harbour four and a half times, has gone missing from the Murray-Darling Basin. Maybe we should check Sydney Harbour and see if it's four and a half times bigger. It was a question we wanted to ask Professor Silo Nunchucker from the Macquarie Group of Unconcerned Scientists, but he couldn't be asked coming on the show. Instead, I tried to speak with government spokesperson Fluffer Cologne. Do you reckon Gideon Rosner waxes his eyebrows? Is it possible the water is being held for ransom by a relative of Angus Taylor in the Cayman Islands? Well, they're very pointy. At least until Barnaby Joyce hands over more money than was originally asked for? Hang on. We're hoping much yeah. of the wildlife and fish and plants and trees in the Murray-Darling catchment area ecosystem uh, will die mm -hmm. and that this will reduce the impact on the water for those of us who need it. Yeah, go on. yeah, but so rather than limit uh, our use of resources, we limit the amount of things that use those resources. Hang on. It's no, the living no, embodiment no. of the Coalition's philosophy. Those upstream get the water first, those downstream get whatever trickles down. Well, that, that's not going to work for everybody, though, is it? Of course it does. Those upstream need the water so they can manufacture things like cotton to make clothes that those downstream need. Yeah, yeah, but when those downstream won't need to wash those clothes, they don't have any water. I'll call you back. It, uh, that's where this new Murray-Darling Basin Compliance Office comes in. To make sure it appears people are doing the right thing and obeying the rules and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but aren't the rules, and to a greater extent, the blah, 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 the problems? Because companies along the river, they've received $41 million from the government for water efficiency projects and they've used it to build dams to store more than 30 billion extra litres of water and irrigate an extra 81 square kilometres of land. I mean, how, how is that in the, in the spirit of the legislation? Sean, there's no point propping up these old and dying waterways when the natural order of things is to let them pass on. We should be encouraging small streams and creeks on other properties to realise their potential. The government's focus has and will always be on the Australian people and ensuring they have enough nuts to to feed their families. Well, nuts require a lot of water to produce, though, don't they? 
Oh, I don't know, I've always found them to be quite dry. What an extraordinary performance. And finally... One of Elon Musk's tech companies has implanted a coin-sized computer chip in the brain of a pig named Gertrude. The device tracks the animal's mental activity, but the company hopes it could one day help people with a disability control computers with their minds. Mm. Sure, this all sounds not insane. Oi, Hamish! But, uh, yeah. Hamish, mate! Yes, yeah, sure, lady in the middle up there. Yeah, you know what Elon Musk is planning here, don't you? Fucking super smart astronaut pigs flying his fucking fancy SpaceX rockets to Mars and that, yeah? So all his mega rich mates just pop over to Mars and start partying like it's 1999, even though it costs a shitload more than that, but it's like 1999 to them, so they're all tripping off their tits, mate, joining the 34 million mile high club and that, while the pig astronauts orbit around the sun like they're on some fucking joint and rotisserie, mate, and then land back on Mars when they're all fucking nice and crispy. Right, and uh, so the passengers eat the astronauts? Yeah, fucking... Uh, how, how then could they get back to Earth? Mate, the joint was fucking robbed when I got here, mate. How could they? How could they get back to Earth? Well, it's not my fucking problem, Hamish. You know, but bloody hell, like machines are one thing, or, or like a few things, I suppose. But you know, don't tell me I have to start competing for a job with a fucking leg of ham that's smarter than me, mate. Like, how am I supposed to put fucking food on the table when the fucking food's got my job, mate? And if you think you know the answer, fucking write to us and shit, and you could be in line at that. STD clinic to win an Anthony Green waste recycling bin. Get rid of all that inaccurate sophology data that no one wants after an action night or during it. Hard rubbish collection also available for that big screen what never seems to work properly. Mmm, that's nice. Friday night, it's the return of Vera. Mum. Body of a man found burnt to death in an abattoir incinerator. Hands and legs bound with wire and a star picket through his chest. This is no accident. We're looking for a murderer. But whom? Eric Tosca. Who's he? The murderer. Eric Tosca. Yes? Hi. Did you murder a man and burn him at the abattoir? Yes. The all-new season of 45-second episodes of Vera starts Friday at 8.30. Well, coming up before Utopia to let us know what's happening later in the week... It's a great night's viewing tonight on your ABC. After Matters Hell, amateur sleuths Chaz and Morgana investigate a slew of fatal shark attacks in Murder by Animal, followed by the former police sergeant Dutton Mysteries. And finally, the late-night bulletin read by Michaelia Cash. And finally, the frustration in Victoria extends beyond the no-maskers to those with pre-existing facial coverings, like Jim here. Jim's group CEO, Jim Penman, this week, wrote a furious letter to Premier Daniel Andrews, saying his roadmap offers no relief. It's a follow-up to his earlier furious letter, saying the Premier should step aside and let someone else take over. Perhaps someone from Jim's governing, the market leader in governing services. Whether it's infrastructure development, health systems or industrial relations, Jim's governing will have your state looking great and running smoothly. Franchises available. Goodbye. Giant baby. What an extraordinary performance.